Thank you so much. We love working with the Louisville Free Public Library. We've had a series of summer programming here as well, um, and art is wonderful to work with, so we're just thrilled to be here. Um, we're thrilled to have all of you here. Thank you so much for supporting this programming. Um, I was able to work with Dr. John Hale this summer on our preview CD, so if you're a subscriber, you should have received this with your, t uh, your season tickets. If you're not, we have extras at the marketing table outside the room, so make sure to pick one up. Um, he talks a lot about the Magic Flute on the preview CD, and they are also excerpts from the other two shows. So I was able to learn a lot from him this summer, which was a lot of fun for me. Um, and I, I'm excited to uh, introduce him now and to welcome him. I think that we would come regardless of what whatever he was talking about. I think we're here for him. Um, it's just an added treat that it's the Magic Flute. This is, of course, our first production with, for the Kentucky Opera season this year. Rehearsals started this week, um, and it's, it's starting. It's a party. It's a great cast. It's a phenomenal show. Uh, so we're really excited about it. Um, this happens to be just something of special interest to Dr. Hale. So again, we're just really excited that this happens to be something he loves. Um, he, uh, as you know, is the director of liberal studies at the University of Louisville, where he teaches all kinds of classes. He has degrees from Yale and Cambridge. In addition to teaching, he has over 30 years of fieldwork experience in archaeology and his works have been published and he's won all kinds of awards. So we're just so thrilled to have him here in Louisville and um, that he's willing to share all of his wisdom with us. Um, again, if you need more information about the Magic Flute, we have marketing information in the back and thank you so much for coming. I'll turn the time over to him. Thanks very much for that introduction. Thank you all for being here this evening to spend some time with what I think is one of the most extraordinary creations of the human imagination ever brought, brought to reality. It was a team effort then. It'll be a team effort when Kentucky Opera brings it to the stage here in Louisville this season. And speaking as an archeologist, I find this the most interesting work of art ever created. As you can see from the themes on the slide, ancient Egypt is one of the elements that looms very large in this extraordinary opera. But there are many other references to other cultures, to secret societies, to political satire, to older musical works, and of course, something we won't have time for tonight, Romanticism was born with this opera. When Tomino starts to play his magic flute, when he rescues that princess in distress, Romanticism is born. The fugue in the overture may sound like Bach, but there are moments here that directly inspired Richard Wagner, Tchaikovsky, other great Romantic composers to come. So these are the many worlds of magic flute. Let's spend some time traveling among them. If you'd been in Vienna in the season, that opera season, you're looking at the actual bill that was uh, put up by plaster, people with plaster on all of the walls and, and street corners and, and uh, theater front in Vienna to let people know that a, a, a first time, Ersten Mola, first time opera called the Zauberflute, the magic flute, was going to be performed. We, of course, associate this 100% with Mozart. As we will see, that's not the order of preference in terms of creativity that the Viennese assigned to who created an opera. And this next picture introduces us to that other personage. Mozart makes the uh, stamps today in our, our time. He's the icon for the classical music world for, uh, thanks to that movie Amadeus, thanks for looming so large uh, on all these things. Uh, uh, Salieri uh, uh, was so impressed with him, he copied him. Pushkin, the great Russian dramatist in the 19th century, wrote a play about Mozart and his rivalry with Salieri. All of this makes him stand above most composers. And he is a genius second to none. What, what he might have achieved had he lived the same length as Bach or even Beethoven, we can only imagine. When we look at his Requiem, which he 
left unfinished at his death, still working on it, we can see he was moving into outer space as far as classical music was going. And some of his very late keyboard and string quartet music is approaching almost atonalism, where we're not going to get back to it till the early 20th century. Romanticism and late classicism took a different turn. I found this little, little image online and it made me happy to look at. It takes a great natural orb, the moon, imposes a face on it. We all know there are faces and men in the moon, things like that. Bestows a crown to suggest we are dealing with the highest possible things. There are queens and, and great heads of religions, faiths that are part of the dramatis personae of the magic flute. And that starry background goes with our queen of the night who's probably the highest ranking person on stage and is presumably, given her name, a sort of goddess who presides over this night world. I also like the impression that the little face is winking at you because just as strong as the dramatic and the spiritual and the cosmic elements of Magic Flute is the comic. Uh, this is the one opera in which Mozart brought all aspects of human experience to the stage thanks to the fact that he partnered with Emmanuel Schikanader, an actor and a writer of play scripts and opera libretti, and he was the one who played the original Papageno. I'd like to begin thinking that there are probably some folks in the room who don't know Magic Flute, and that those of you who do and may have sat through a number of uh, different productions enthralled by each different take on this won't mind a little refresher on the basic storyline and contents. The overture is something unique in Mozart. It's a prelude and fugue. We will see Mozart had had an experience with the music of Bach. It stayed with him. And in this, in some ways, most lighthearted and comic of his operas, there's nobody funnier in any classical opera than Papageno the Birdcatcher, there's still time for some very arcane musical science. The curtain goes up on act one, scene one of Mozart's magic flute with one of those things that everybody who counsels you on how to write a novel or a, a play script or a movie uh, scenario tells you to do, grab them by the throat with the first frame. And the ancient way of saying that was, Aristotle said this, always begin, this is a Latin for the Greek Aristotle used, in medias res, in the middle of the thing. Don't start with an introduction, with an explanation of who's who, with the backstory of the whole action. Start with the action. Start with the action while it's at its crisis. So who do we meet? We meet a prince, seen here to the left, and we're gonna see stills from a lot of different contemporary productions of magic flute to illustrate the story. And we see this prince pursued by a monster, a dragon a serpent, something of the wild woods, like something out of Tolkien or something out of the medieval romances of knights slaying dragons that is after this prince. And so in this act one, the dragon is killed, but he is crushed, wounded, passes out from loss of blood. Maybe it's just shock, but suddenly there appear three ladies, ladies armed with spears. Already we're way outside normal 18th century Vienna. Dragons first, spear bearing trios of ladies next, who are very proud of this killing of this monster of darkness, the dragon, and who are now very interested in this young prince who has stumbled into their domain and the domain of their mistress. As we will see, they serve a great ruler named the Königin der Nacht, the Queen of the Night. Now, they're not the only person who's, people who serve the Queen of the Night. Quickly onto the scene is one of her lesser servants, a little fellow, a little green man who catches birds. And his name, Papageno. And uh, in Portuguese anyway, Papagaio is a puppet or a, a doll, and it's, he's not fully human. I mean, he often is shown as a bird man with feathers. This is a strange world we are in with magic flute. Even Wagner didn't get quite this weird and wild in the ring where he did have Rhine maidens swimming around in the water. Papageno is, is something out of the early Middle Ages, that green man of the woods, 
lying outside the realm of civilized folk, beyond the pale of Christendom, outside the rule of emperors and kings, but older than any of them. So Papageno is going to be the comic relief, but never lose sight of the fact that he's standing in for the natural one of each one of us. Nature in our human nature is Papageno. He's come along to catch birds. He serves the queen also, as do the three ladies. He's catching birds for her. She apparently has a taste for songbirds either to eat or to listen to, never made clear. And so he sees the dragon, is, is terrified, and now we have all our, our folks together. Off to the left is Papageno, the bird man. In the middle of the flute is this Tamino, this prince who had come up against the dragon, has now revived, sees the dragon dead, and we have these three ladies who are associated, we find, with the queen of the night. They're her entourage, they're her ladies in waiting. They seem to have some supernatural powers themselves. And they tell these two fellows they need to go on a quest. There is a mission that is being entrusted to them by the mistress of these three ladies, the queen of the night herself. It is to rescue her daughter. The daughter's name is Pamina. She's being held captive. And to rescue this princess, the two men are given special gifts. It's an opera, so they are musical gifts. Tamino is given a magical flute. When he plays upon it, well, they don't really tell him what it will do. We'll find out what it do, does later on in the opera. And to Papageno, they give some magical bells. These will help them somehow in the trials and dangers that lie ahead as they try to find and rescue the daughter of the Queen of the Night and restore that young woman to her mother. Once the two men have accepted the quest, the Queen of the Night herself appears. I deliberately chose the zaniest stage design I could find for her. She's kind of grinning. She's got a crescent moon on her crown, swaths of bespangled, starstruck, black gauze. She ain't very maternal. Uh, to be the, the one obvious mother in the whole show, the, the mother of the heroine, whose name, by the way, is Pamina. But after striking these, these, these two fellows, Tamino, the prince, and Papageno, the birdman, stunned with amazement by her epiphany, her showing forth, she gives them the mission. They must save her daughter, Pamina, from those who have kidnapped and are holding her against her will. And she promises to reward them. They will receive great rewards. And, as we've already seen, she gives them these magical instruments, Papageno, some bells, and Tamino the prince, a magic flute. Since it can charm wild beasts, Tamino suddenly harks back for us to those ancient Greek and Roman myths of Orpheus. Orpheus, the greatest musician in human history, whose songs enchant wild people and wild animals so that they gather near to listen to him. The Orpheus myth is the sort of soul of the enlightenment. The idea that reason, light, order, and the symbols of those things, music, can take raw, wild nature and put it right, make it benign, make it tame. Ancient Greeks and Romans felt exactly that same way about Orpheus, so Tamino and Papageno, as they play their bells and charm wild things, they're going to be reenacting this, this, this scene from a Roman mosaic. This is one of the most popular of all supernatural scenes to have on your mosaic patio or dining hall wherever you live in the Roman Empire, from Britain to Egypt, from Morocco to the steppes of Russia, you're going to find Orpheus mosaics. Because civilization, after all, is the taming of brute and wild nature, and this is the supreme emblem of that, and music is the supreme emblem of the, the, the humanizing, the civilizing force. They kind of part ways, uh, Papageno runs off, but then three little genies, they were played by boys in the original Mozart production. They may have been uh, Vienna choir boys on loan. They're often still portrayed by boys. But the three high voices, some early manuscripts call them genies, which means 
in a classical sense, a spirit, an idealized spirit, not necessarily something that comes out of a lamp that you rub on. And sometimes they're just called knaven, boys. Well, the, the uh, production I thought was humorous was the one that recognized it's kind of tough music and had uh, uh, three excellent young uh, sopranos and one alto sing them and decided to show their do-gooder and can-do-anything attitude by dressing them up as scouts. They're going to be coming on throughout the opera and they will be an antidote to our three ladies. At this stage, it's still not clear who's who and who's good and who's bad and who's evil. Remember, these three boys have been conjured up by the three ladies. But from now on, things change. And it's going to become clear that the queen of the night is not a bereft mother simply looking out of love to recover her daughter and is fixed on a young hero to do it. Everything now turns around so the queen of the night becomes evil incarnate and her three ladies become her manipulators. There are people who actually believe, and I think it's the, the jury will always be out on this, but it certainly makes sense, that up to this point, it was supposed to be the loving mother who was being served by the hero, and that Sarastro, the base, bases are typically the bad guys, and nobody sings lower than Sarastro. He was the bad guy, and he and his secret order of Egyptian priests worshiping Isis and Osiris, they were what needed to be combated by mother love and heroic daring. If that was ever the idea, it was abandoned before most of the music was composed. But it wouldn't be out of place with the lovely music of the three ladies in the beginning of the first act and that first, well, both arias of the queen of the night. She sounds angry, but she doesn't sound evil. And what she's famous for is her stunning staccato coloratura, those flights all the way up to high, high F. Mozart had a sister-in-law who sang this originally, and uh, she had that note in her range, and he gave it to her again and again and again as the queen of the night. So she's illustrating being Astrafiamante, the star flaming queen. All those sparkling, shining stars are in her high, high coloratura but that can go either way, positive, negative. We won't come back to that, but I just wanted to make you aware it's one of the 101 most debated questions about this most debatable and enigmatic of all operas. I will say unto you, if you like Parsifal and The Ring of the Nibelung, Wagner is child's play compared to Mozart and Schikanator, who wrote the libretto for Magic Flute. Our hero goes off the bird catcher, who he should have stuck with, he finds the princess right away. We can't quite figure out how. He frees the, the princess with his magic bells, and I, my editorial on this moment that it's the uh, second gun sidekick who does the actual heroic rescue, well, it's the enlightenment. And so the working man, the ordinary human, not the elevated, lofty, idealized hero who actually gets the job done. Meanwhile, Tamino is still looking, unaware that the princess has been found, and now that Pamina, the source of his quest, and Papageno are now looking for him, because they don't have cell phones, and there's just no way to get in touch. So they're all roaming around in this dark wood together, like something out of the Brothers Grimm, and these strange beasts appear to Tamino, and he plays his flute to enchant them. He comes ultimately to the temple. Three doors with words like wisdom, truth above the doors. Strange creatures approach him. He calms them with his, his magic. And he is initially denied entrance to the temple. He is not yet initiated. He's not yet ready. He's not yet worthy as a voice from inside the temple shouts at him. But by the end of the act, Tamino has encountered Sarastro, who is the head of the temple, who was out hunting, who was out hunting dragons and beasts. He has been taken kind of prisoner under house arrest by Sarastro, who doesn't know who he is. And they encounter Papageno and Pamina in the act one finale as they're all headed back to the temple. As the act one curtain comes down, Sarastro recognizes Pamina, it's the daughter of the queen of the night, 
Papageno, who, who he already knows of as a servant to the Queen of the Night, and Tamino, who he's just met, as this prince from far away who's entered this strange forest and who has the potential not only to become one of this order of people within the temple, but possibly the savior of them all. Inside the temple in Act Two, we discover that the presiding deities are Egyptian god and goddess of light, of fertility, of life, of the river, Isis and Osiris. And Sarastro turns out to be a high priest, among other things, who sings great, sonorous psalms of praise in honor of Isis and Osiris at various points in the opera. He decrees that the lovers must be separated. Tamino needs to go through trials. Again, think fraternity initiations. He's got to learn secrets. He's got to survive ordeals. He's got to show himself worthy. Pamina, it is assumed, because she's a woman, really can't be. So she's just now back in the woods. So in a grand scene, Tamino accepts his assignment. He will take on the magic flute and he will now undergo imposed trials of silence and other tests. It's hard to make them look life-threatening on stage and I've never seen a production that succeeded, but they are trials by fire and water and other elemental trials. Pamina has been found by her mother, the Queen of the Night, who we last saw at the very beginning of Act One, giving the weapon, the dagger, to Tamino to kill Sarastro. And now we see coming back down in a blaze of anger for another epic aria, demanding that Pamina be a faithful daughter, kill the enemy of her mother, Sarastro. This is the first thing she must do. You can tell from the picture of this still from a, an opera production. Pamina resists kicking and screaming all the way. And finally, due to her own spirit of independence, her own desire to do what's right, she doesn't have the be benefit of a wise Sarastro helping her out or initiating her. She's the real hero slash heroine of this opera. She defies her mother and she presents Tamino with the key to this magic flute. She explains it was carved by her father Presumably this is the Queen of the Night's husband, but we never got to know his name, and all she says is, it was carved from the wood of a thousand-year-old oak on a night of storm and rain and wind. So a mystical way to get a mystical flute out of a sacred tree on a special dark elemental night is the backstory of our magic flute. And since it goes by in about 30 seconds in the course of an extended ensemble, it's easy as an audience member to miss this essential point. We really aren't sure that her father is the Queen of the Night's lawful husband. We don't know if he's still living. Was he King of the Night, King of the Day? We don't know. But he is the maker of the magic flute. And since it's a force for taming nature and for doing good things, he must have been, her father must have been, a, a force for good. She's ultimately reunited, as I said, with Tamino, and they go to face his final trials together. As I say, I've never seen a production that made them look very scary, but they sound scary. Fire and water, think of running through flaming warehouses and buildings and coming out alive the other side. Think of walking through tsunamis and tidal waves. That's what it's supposed to simulate. It doesn't help that Mozart, instead of writing music that represents the trials, the dangers, the terrors, only wrote the music for the magic flute that stills them. So Tamino's little, little playing of the flute, uh, no singing involved until he's passed each of the two trials. That's what sees us through. Uh, illustrators did their best by showing barred gates, cascading Niagara's of water, flaming rocks. It's one of the things that you've got to really trust to audience suspension of disbelief. So once they get through the last of the trials, this invisible choir sings a grand song of triumph. We know that he will go back and join the Brotherhood. We know we can see what the final uh, scene of this act is going to be, but there is a loose end to wrap up. Papageno also was looking for a beloved. Uh, he was ridiculed by the three ladies and others who just felt he was unworthy of anything. And he's about to hang himself and he has a very touching a uh, tiny aria about nun volan, now goodbye, false world. 
He makes the noose, he finds a tree branch to throw it around, and he's about to hang himself. Leib full, goodbye. When out come our saviors, the three little genies, the three little boys, and they tell him, stop, stop, you're a fool, you don't understand, everything will, will come to those who are patient and wait. And after he's argued with them and finally come around and is asking them questions, they finally shout out, because the, the final character has stolen on from the wings, he saw her in a vision in act one, now he sees her in the flesh. The three boys bring in Papagena, the bird woman designed through all eternity to be the, the mate of the bird man. And as they sing their little final song, Mozart, who was the father of several children, along with Constanza, their mother, um, has Papageno and Papageno imagine their little happy family to be, how they'll have another little Papageno and another little Papagena and another little Papageno and another little Papagena, and finally end by saying, we will have several of each. Because if it started to sound like a fighter, are we gonna have boys or girls? They're just gonna have a really big family as bird people should. And in some, it, this is their final lines in Mozart and Schikaneder's script. We end back at the Grand Temple with Pamina and Tamino, now the great forces for light in the world. Often people do bring in Papageno, Papagena, and the kids for a, a final feel-good family finale, but they're not actually in the script. And you are left to think or maybe wonder, was this a cosmic drama, and are we seeing the birth of a new world order based on harmony, on music, on survival of dangers, commitment to quests, seeking, finding, sharing experiences, and the bonding of two people to form a whole that can lead us all forward. The music is at times so strong, so deep, in a way that outside the Requiem, none of Mozart's other music was, and he was working on the Requiem at this time. You have to think that every one of those thoughts was in Mozart's mind, and we gotta remember it's Schikaneder's libretto, words and characters that make them all possible for us to feel too. So this little image that I gave you before, Schikaneder showing us magic Flute is the uh, character Papageno, Mozart commemorated for all the world see on the German stamp. They both count. Magic flute is the sum of these two geniuses, one immortal, one relatively unsung in popular culture today, but both still perpetually renewed in consciousness by things like Amadeus, the movie which is still out there and which many of you have seen which undertook to dramatize the rivalry between Mozart and his older contemporary, Salieri, who was the rich, the preferred, the imperially patronized master composer of Vienna as Mozart was trying to get a toehold. And many of the scenes of Amadeus deal with Mozart's last, life, last year of life and the creation of Magic Flute. The Papageno character, Schikaneder, is in many of the scenes are you ready to meet him? I still don't quite know who this, who this means, but what's being represented on the movie posters is a nightmarish thing that happened to Mozart in his last year of life. It was a dark and stormy day. There was a hammering on his door. I guess Constanza was out because he answered it. And a stranger in dark clothing was there who did not identify himself, clearly a man of rank, who thrust into Mozart's hands a commission that he would write a requiem, and that that requiem would be rewarded with what sounds like it was probably the biggest cash payment that Mozart had ever received for anything. The door closed, the stranger departed, Constanza came down to see what had happened, and Mozart described it in the tones of an awestruck person who felt like he'd seen a visitor from another world. And from that time on, as he started to get into his final illness, he thought he had been visited by the angel of death, and that the requiem was the commission for his own requiem, that this was the end of his life. So now he's scrambling to finish Magic Flute on the top of all these other terrors that are besetting him. He also has mundane threats, and one of them is the, the anti-hero of that movie, Amadeus, F. Murray Abraham, consummate scream act actor, playing the Italian master composer, Antonio Salieri. If you want to hear a concerto that can 
match any of Mozart's wind or string concertos, listen to the double concerto for flute and oboe by Antonio Salieri. If that finale doesn't make you smile with joy from beginning to end, go see your psychologist because there's something seriously wrong. Nonetheless, he was in a tougher world than Mozart. Mozart had many strings to his bow. Mozart seems to have been content to scramble along. Salieri was up on the top of the imperial intrigues with the imperial court theaters. He had a, a role with the imperial family that Mozart did not. Mozart was recognized by the emperor, Joseph II. He was imperial composer of chamber music. So the string quartets, the wind pieces, those were all recognized as valuable things by the imperial family. The idea that he lived in a gutter and died in an attic and lived his last days in obscurity is wrong. But Salieri was the toast of the town. He was the one who had imperial patronage for grand operas to be brought forth on the prime stages of Vienna. Out of this rivalry, Alexander Pushkin, Russia's greatest dramatist, wrote a great play, Mozart and Salieri. And this is what lies behind our familiar popular music. Uh, movie Amadeus is the script by uh, Pushkin, but it had engraved its, itself on Pushkin's mind as the ideal issue in art. Are you going to serve your bank account and write music or paint paintings or create novels and plays that serve the spirit of your time and will be hits with the public and the box office are you going to be true to yourself, the voice within, and hell or high water? Heed that voice and make your creations reflect it. Mozart clearly chose the, the latter path. There were times he wrote very popular stuff, but that was by accident. He was always writing what he really liked. His piano concertos were popular, his religious music less so, his symphonies on the edge, and some of the operas were big hits, like Magic Flute, and others the world just wasn't ready for. And some of the string quartets almost get into atonal music by his final year. He's looking ahead to Schoenberg in a way that nobody else will until the 20th century comes around, as I said. Amadeus gave us many famous images, thanks to uh, Hulsa, who, who played this wonderful rendering of Mozart with the fright wig on. So here we see here Mozart holding all of Vienna spellbound as he conducts some of his compositions, and up in the box, utterly frustrated, it's F. Murray Abraham. There was an immediate re rumor at the time when Mozart died so young, because the rumor mill had been making a lot, as gossip mills will, about rivalries. Uh, read, read Broadway and Hollywood uh, journals, as I like to do to keep in touch on some marginal level with my own popular culture. Uh, and there's a lot about feuds, anger, backbiting, revenge. Everybody was willing to believe when Mozart died so young, Salieri did it. And there might have been people who respected him for that. After all, job's got to be done. We know that's not true, and Salieri's almost his last words on his deathbed years later were, I did not poison Mozart. No, Mozart had a formal autopsy. I do not know what Miliary fever is, but that's what the, the Viennese doctor diagnosed he died of. It was probably also just overwork. He was probably getting about four hours of sleep a night for months on end, taking all these commissions, writing away, drinking hard, staying out late with his friends, not wrapping up with an overcoat when he went out in the winter, all the things our mothers tell us not to do. Mozart never grew up, and he died almost a child's death, of just not paying attention to what you need to do to stay healthy. So we've gotten a, an idea of the background of this opera, what's in it. Let's start looking at some of the elements that are the worlds behind Salvaflutta that go beyond these little uh, things specific to Vienna. We've already met its creators, Schikaneder and Mozart. Let's look at the opera house. This is its modern version, the original building that they used, the Theater an der Wied, or Wiedner Theater, on the edge of Vienna then, the current Theater an der Wien, Theater of Vienna, which took its place, is now right downtown. Vienna has really exploded since Mozart's and Schikaneder's time. What was countryside outside the city gates is now the heart of town. As I said, we have the handbill. 
And let's look at some surprising things about it. You can see that uh, L and a Roman numeral two and the very central orb, the coat of arms at the top, that stands for Leopold II. Zum ersten Mal, Mal. die Zauberflöte, for the first time, the magic flute. And if you can read the fine print, you will see it says a grand opera in two acts by Emmanuel Schikanator. That's not how we phrase it. That's not how we think of it. We give all the credit to Mozart. It's Mozart's magic flute. As I said, for every thousand people who've heard of the magic flute, maybe a few dozen have ever heard of Schikanator. Vienna and the spirit of the people at the time credited the creator of the book, the libretto. Libretto just means little book. And when you get into something as big as Marriage of Figaro or Salvo for Luda, you should take the etto off. These are big books. They credited that as the creator. After all, that's the story. That's the characters. That's all the spoken words of all the songs and all of the recitatives and all the dialogue that create the characters, the action, everything else. The, the, the musician, the composer was more important than the scenery painter, but somehow not up there with the librettist. So here we meet Johann Josef Emanuel was the name he, he went by, Schikanator, who Vienna celebrated as this great creator of this wonderful opera. Born 1st of September, 1751 in Bavaria. His parents, uh, as we'll see, were very poor. Died 21st September, 1812. A big year for Europe. That's, of course, why Napoleon invades Russia. Schikanator was born in a house in Bavaria where his mother and father, they were desperately poor. They could only make a living as servants, not even valets and ladies in waiting. That is the world Schikanator grew up in with a fire in his belly, unlike that of Mozart. Remember, Mozart is brought up by Leopold Mozart, a salaried composer in residence, an honored musician in Salzburg, working for the Archbishop of Salzburg. Salzburg rubbing shoulders with aristocracy. And as soon as Mozart and Nannerl, his little sister, show they can play the piano, both of them at a precocious age. They become a brother-sister act. They travel to Europe together. They go to Paris and meet Marie Antoinette. They go to England and meet the king and queen. These two kids. So very different experiences between Schikanator and Mozart. And I think the man of the world lies behind the idea of what's in the magic flute. Uh, within the uh, personum, the, the list of cast characters, if you look down to Papageno, there is Schikanator. If we look down at the, the bottom, we can see some information finally about Mozart. Actually, it's midway down the, the whole page. And in the top line of what I've given you, uh, you can see uh, the Musik is by uh, Wolfgang Amade Mozart, Kapellmeister, so he is, has a, 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 a chapel a position. He writes sacred music for Vienna churches. And as I said, he is the chamber composer to the emperor himself. Down at the bottom, you see the two little cartoons that represent what Schikanator, who designed the sign, wanted you to remember. Magic Flute is one of his grand comic and heroic operas. Mozart was, was a hijinks, practical joker through and through. He followed after his for a short time teacher, Joseph Haydn, who was also a great humorist in music and in life. So the humor part was fine. Mozart and Haydn loved that, so did Schikanator. But Schikanator felt he wanted his opera house to be a place that the nobility would come to. The nobility liked to laugh, but they didn't like to laugh unless there was an edge to the entertainment that included the noble, the grand, the heroic, even the tragic. And so the bottom, you can see the king's crown, you can see the hilt of a sword. You can see some sort of castle or grand building in the background. All of this is the double world of Magic Flute in the eyes of the people of the time. It straddled a fence. Comic and lighthearted, ordinary people of lower class, and quasi-divinities, princesses, queens, rulers of the universe. Now, Mozart and Schikanator had some common ground. They were both Freemasons. Now, this is one way 
that non-royal people, non-aristocratic people in Renaissance Europe and onward began to establish themselves as on an equal par with aristocrats. Aristocrats were famous for doing no work. They organized the work of others, they owned the land, they had all of the, the capital so others could carry out work projects, get paid and eat, but they belonged to a different order of being. Freemasons were ordinary working people who began to feel I'm the equal of any aristocrat, king, duke, prince, I'm the equal of any church person, abbot, pope, bishop, because I work, because I create. It's masonry as in mason, working with stone and concrete. That's what it's about. We are the builders of your world. And they invented for themselves a lineage that traced themselves back into remote history to justify that. So this is common meeting ground for Mozart and Schikanator. They are craftsmen, they are workers, they are creators. Schikanator had a lot of these comic operas, working people's entertainments to his credit, starting with Oberon, way back in 1789, king of the elves, and you may remember that uh, Carl Maria von Weber did a great uh, opera, overture of some music called Oberon, about the, the magical uh, fairy king who also shows up in Mozart's Midsummer Night's Dream. He's the king to the queen, Titania, the queen of the, the spirits. Then in 1790, his first collaboration with Mozart, Mozart's already just one year away from death at this point, the Philosopher's Stone or the Magic Isle. Grand, heroic, comic opera. That's the only kind that Schikanator liked. Music by Schock, Henneberg, Gerl, Schikanator himself, a composer, and Mozart. That one has actually been recorded. And if you want to get a recording of some of Mozart's least commonly heard music and hear it in the context that lots of people heard it in where he was doing what are called pastiches or pastichos with other composers, get Der Stein der Weisen, the stone of the philosopher, and you can hear all that music. 1791 big year, this is magic flute year, but before that, well, got to keep an iron in the fire. He also produced the magic cap, which uh, the nickname was the beneficent dervish, like a whirling dervish. So it was one of those little fez type dervish caps was the magic cap. And to the opera going public who flocked to the Theater an der Wied, Mozart's magic flute was just another in the series of these magical, folkloric, entertaining, exotic locale, comical, historical, tragical entertainments. And then a sequel to the magic flute. Six years after the death of Mozart, he wrote Babylon's Pyramid, sequel to the magic flute. I believe I have the only copy of the piano vocal score of Babylon's Pyramids in captivity in America. Um, eBay is a wonderful thing and it's international. And I forget whether it was Austria or Germany, but someone posted uh, under opera uh, scores, uh, Babylon's Pyramids, uh, music by Schikanator. And I thought, oh my God, it's the sequel to the Magic Flute. Mozart's long dead, but this is the sequel. So I got it. Uh, if you have a little handout sheet, it's got the cover page with the little engraving that seems to show a sort of golden calf sacrificial ceremony among those evil Babylonians. Where the pyramids come in, I am having a hard time trying to get. They, I guess they knew about Babylonian ziggurats or something and decided to call them pyramids. This is the tradition Magic Flute is part of. Popular entertainment at a uh, outside the city theater that was a draw for the emperor himself, all the way down to street urchins to crowd into the the standing room at the back and listen to an entertainment that needed to address the high and the low and Babylon's Pyramids has its comic stuff. Every one of Schikanator's operas had to have a part for him. In Magic Flute, he was Papageno, the comic little man of the woods who had the bells and the, the whistle and so on. In this, he plays a guy named Forte, a comic minor serving class character whose girlfriend happens to be named Piano. So when they sing together, it's Piano Forte. Uh, and I've given you on the back of the uh, sheet uh, the first start of one of their duets, 
And if you hum through the little bit for, for the, the Chicanator character, the Pap Papageno uh, retread as Forte, it sounds just like Mozart. So Mozart here was, of course, composing in Chicanator style. He was composing folk style, and uh, Winter and uh, Gallus, who were the two composers for Babylon's Pyramids, duplicated that style. So we got more of Papageno, and I hope someday we can. What, what a great thing for Kentucky Opera to bring out the sequel to the Magic Flute for the first time in America. I'm just saying. Vienna, 1791. This is the residence where Constanza and Wolfgang Amadeus Mozart are living, and this is where Mozart got sick and died. And after that, the, the magic flute was one of the really enduring hits of his repertoire. Don Giovanni bothered some people with its immorality. Uh, Cosi fan tutte just started to seem very arcane and courtly. Uh, but magic flute really had legs. And so there were lots and lots of images. We got more images of magic flute characters and stage sets from the first half of the 19th century than all the rest of Mozart's works put together. I want to spend some time with this very early 19th century set because it helps to illustrate some important things about Schikanator and his importance. I didn't know till I found this, because I hadn't found it in any reference book, that at a point where a priest actually sings, there's a priest who sings to Tamino giving him instructions. That was Schikanator's father. He was a showman too. He was in his son's opera. He was playing an elder role, singing lines. It was a family thing. And then there's the, the sense of this is a, a sort of a mystical journey for the archetypal hero. Uh, there's a great book out there, the, the Hero of a Thousand Faces. And it's all about the idea that all stories in human folklore are one story. Whether male or female, there is one hero. The hero has an Odyssean uh, journey to make, many faces, but it's always the same set of trials, disappointments, obstacles to overcome, meeting with the long for partner in life, glimpsing the desired goal or treasure, but everything denied till the final moment when it all comes together. And of course, that's the end of the story. So the hero prince of the Birdman, Birdman is going to be one of those early creatures that helps the hero finally get to his ultimate goal, union with this ideal mate. In this case, it's a daughter of the queen of the night. I've called her a royal princess. She's a semi-divine princess, for crying out loud. Her mother is night. But they are, their union, which is deferred till the very last pages of the opera, is the ultimate event. But of course, Papageno, the, 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 the bird man, the audience has come to love him, so he's got to find his mate too. This is the resolution of all happy comedies. They end in weddings, and there's a double one in Magic Flute. But out at the either end of this row of cast, you'll see a, a strange figure called Sarastro at the far left. He's the deep bass who runs this hidden society of, of priests. And then off to the right, a, a divine queen, queen of the night, a force of nature. As we look at these two, we can feel that we are seeing something way beyond an ordinary entertainment. And that's what has given Mozart's magic flute its legs, its staying power in popular culture ever since it was presented, was this element of cosmic drama. And with these characters, hero and birdman, hero prince and high priest, hero prince and subsidiary priest, all of our friends, we work our way into a world that is visionary in a way that not even Parsifal gets to. I'm not saying Mozart's music is always on the level of Wagner's Ring of the Nibelung in terms of profundity, but we're still going to listen to it, aren't we? And it's still some of the greatest hits in the operatic repertoire, and the, the Romantic Age itself loved that cosmic element. I think that's why Don Giovanni, where hell opens and demons come and drag Don Giovanni down to hell at the end, that's cosmic. And the magic flute with this battle of light and darkness, the queen of the night and Sarastro, the, the worshiper of light, Isis and Osiris, all of that makes this so appealing. Now, many people felt that the queen of the night was a parody of Maria Teresa. She'd been dead 11 years, but she was the queen, the empress, under whom Mozart passed all of his younger years. Maria Theresa was famous to Mozart as having given a scolding to Franz Joseph Haydn 
when he was a Vienna choir boy, taken out to Schönbrunn Palace when it was under construction to sing a little choral piece for Empress Maria Theresa and all the choir boys, well, led by Franz Joseph Haydn, who was then about 12, started climbing the scaffolding. And Maria Theresa ran up to the upper window, stuck her head out and said, get down, identified Franz Joseph Haydn by his face and had him caned for having run up her scaffolding. So in ways small and great, this, this great tyrant, Maria Theresa, uh, left a mark. She also left the marks, I used to collect coins. The most wonderful coin ever created is a taller that she created with the arms of the Habsburgs on the back, the double-headed eagle, all the quarterings and, and images of their different realms. And it's still struck today because in the trading networks of the Eastern Mediterranean and the Near East, this is the one legal, acceptable everywhere tender is Maria Theresa's image on this silver dollar size coin. I used to think that this might be a picture of, of Schikanator, that's very early 19th century, but then I found this image this is from a couple of years after the premiere. And I think if we look closely at this scene where he's shown with Tamino outside the temple and the three ladies are speaking to him, and there's the, there's the serpent looking about as fearsome as a, uh, a toy you'd find under a Christmas tree. I like the neat cutting into three. Did each of the ladies dispose of one piece? I don't know, but that's uh, supposed to be uh, Papagino off to the right in the premiere performed by Schikanator, and I think that picture must be an actual portrait caricature of Schikanator himself. Always remember, we mustn't forget him. He's the one who created Magic Flute. The concept, the idea is all this wealth of meaning that I'm trying to share my feelings about with you tonight. This is Schikanator. Mozart made him unforgettable. Schikanator was the originator of the ideas. What Mozart and Schikanator shared, as I said, outside the opera house was Freemasonry. They would go to meetings that looked just like this in special Masonic halls. Sometimes they met in each other's homes. And it was a bond of working class people. There were some aristocrats who became Freemasons. They admired the ideals. It's part of the democratizing ideals of, well, our American Revolution of 1776 helped really get the ball rolling with a new actual nation state now on the other side of the Atlantic, interacting with all these people. But Masonic meetings were a place where in these hardcore absolute monarchies like France up until the French Revolution, Austro-Hungarian, Freemasonry was a place you could breathe. You could think this is our territory, this little room, this little brotherhood, we are free people. And what it was based on was the idea that they could trace themselves back to the original workers of human history. There was also a sense that life was a great set of staircases leading up and down, different shades and grades of Freemasonry, but different steps of life, stages of understanding. Freemasonry, like many secret societies, is about a series of revelations. You don't get everything all at once. If, you, if any of you are fraternity and sorority pledges, you know certain things are revealed to you at the beginning, certain things are revealed to people outside, more is revealed to you as you get into it, more will be revealed as you stay with it. Same thing with this Freemasonry. They believed that they built the pyramids that the original Freemasons were those folks, and they seem to have known they weren't slaves who built the Great, Great Pyramid. The pyramid was built by Egyptian farmers during that several month long period of Nile flood that happened every year, when they couldn't get at their fields and they paid their taxes by going up to Giza and hauling those stones around to build another pyramid. So it was labor of free people who knew how to do it. And the Freemasons looked at this and thought, that's the ultimate symbol of genius of the laborer. The king's name is on it, Cheops, Khufu, the pharaoh, but we see the genius, the achievement, the craftsmanship of all those workers. Many of our founding fathers were Freemasons. That's why we've got the pyramid on our dollar bill with Freemason mottos above and below. 1776, New Order of Ages, which is what Novus Ordo, Ordo Seculorum means under the pyramid on our American dollar bill. Um, I, liked, I found this online, a little uh, website for my favorite Masonic books, rings, and shirts. Um, you can see the, the great Egyptian eye in the pyramid staring out at you from the, the little compass that you use to draw things and the 
the carpenter and so Mason square. Those are the superimposed emblems of Masons. And Mozart and Schikaneder knew these, wore them too. They were their badges. And there you see them on the ring. You can find Masonic halls from Singapore to Venice. All look sort of temple-like. They all hark back to the classical world and to ancient times. A couple of Masonic halls to look at still in use. That one is in London, England. But there's one in Colombia, South America. It's a universal thing in this world, Masonhood. And this is a Masonic opera, the Masonic opera. And some modern Masonic stagings really go all out to remind you, yes, it's about the Masonic world. Now, 19th century was very opposed to Freemasonry. That's why the Masonic stuff had to be kind of occult in a Catholic empire like Austria, uh, where the Pope and his will is communicated directly to the Empress if something goes wrong, or the Emperor. So that's why Magic Flute is a conundrum, a coded message. It's essentially a fairy tale, a prince and a princess, and dangers in a forest. But Mozart made darn sure in the music and in the chicanator and the libretto, those who were initiates could read it as a Masonic drama. This is the emperor under whom it was presented. He rejoiced in the name Joseph Benedict Augustus John Antony Michael Adam von Habsburg Lothringen. Kaiser and Imperator were his, his titles, and he's known to history as Emperor Joseph II. He's the son of Maria Theresa. He's the ruler of the Austro-Hungarian Empire in Mozart's time. He hadn't been very long on the throne and didn't have a very long uh, reign, but he is responsible for the fact that Mozart's magic flute came out because he, through the censors, gave permission for something that could have been looked at as a political rivalry. It was clear to him the, the queen of the night might be his mom, but he gave permission. And, I, and he's not very well pro portrayed in that movie Amadeus, uh, but I think that's wrong. Uh, and, you know, with that chamber music post he gave Mozart, that was, a, that was a regular salary. Whether Mozart produced, and he often didn't produce, being Mozart, but the emperor kept it up. So let's spare a thought for him. This opera wouldn't exist without him either. These are the many worlds of the magic flutes. A little tasting tour on an afternoon. Thank you for joining me. There are many more worlds to discover. Thank you.